It's Monday, September 21st, and this is now on H&N. As our numbers are coming down. Oahu's stay-at-home order is about to expire. What changes can you expect? We should not take any risks. Everyone wears a mask, everyone socially distances, and we trace and test people, and we can easily stop this disease. Questions remain over the state's pre-travel testing program as we get closer to the date to restart tourism. In all due respect, we should wait till the services are over. President Trump promises to name a replacement for Ruth Bader Ginsburg this week. I'm Deborah Alferon at the White House with who he's considering and what's next. Erosion is a really big issue here. These stories plus a new study says 40% of the state's beaches could disappear in 30 years. What's being done to address sea level rise? Coming up on This Is Now. Well, one of the things we are talking about is uh, providing a reopening framework and, and talking about uh, triggers, um, the different um, uh, activities and businesses that would be uh, open specifically in the, in the various uh, tiers of uh, virus activity uh, and really uh, providing the benchmarks that would uh, drive decisions to um, reopen activity or to restrict it. That's Governor Ige there giving an update to our friends at the Star Advertiser just a short time ago. He's talking about the res- restrictions that could soon be eased here on Oahu. Let's get you to the latest numbers on coronavirus. That's right. The Hikilo Medical Center says two more residents at the Yukio Ukutsu State Veterans Home have died. There have now been 25 deaths at the Hilo facility so far. The state health department is reporting 56 new COVID-19 cases today. The breakdown by county shows 49 are on Oahu and seven are on the Big Island. Meanwhile, Honolulu's latest stay-at-home order is set to expire this week. Uh, next week, oh, this week, Thursday at 12.01 a.m. We asked Lieutenant Governor Josh Green about what changes we could expect this week. I do think that the mayor uh, will have to owes us a a description of the next iteration of the plan today. I think that you have to give people notice. Do I think that we should uh, lift some of the restrictions? Yes, I do. I think that people have done an excellent job, an excellent job lowering these numbers. The rolling seven day average is now at about 100 per day, way down from like 250 a day. Our positivity rate is down around 2.2, 2.3%. That's very good news. And we do have to get some economic activity going. But let me caution people. This is very important. Even though we're doing so well and they'll make some changes to lessen the restrictions, we still should not gather in significant groups. We still must wear a mask. You have to still wear a mask. Don't let your guard down, people, please, because we saw how fast with big gatherings or letting our guard down just a little bit how fast this thing got out of control. So I think that they probably will announce some loosening restrictions, very likely things like being able to go out in your household grouping to the beach, no big deal, probably very small gatherings in other places, but I don't wanna confuse matters. Let's let the mayor and the governor make that announcement. And then everyone, you still be just as safe with with your precautions wearing a mask. All right, Dr. Grant, I also wanna ask you about an update on those tree travel testing plans. Now, we've been talking about this for months, and I'm just wondering how much farther you've gotten into this planning process, and also just knowing that people are coming here and they're supposedly quarantined, but it's hard to enforce, why they're waiting so long to roll this out? Well, the waiting, I actually had hoped that we could do it back in July when the rates were very low, okay? Now, let me be completely clear on what the standard's gonna be. Within 72 hours of a person's departure, within 72 hours of their departure, they must get a test. It's called the nucleic acid amplification test, the NAT test. That's the standard test. We'll have all sorts of websites where you can click and see that the tests are applicable. Within 72 hours of departure, people will get a test, will verify at the airport, and that is it. It will decrease the risk very significantly, not perfectly, but very significantly, and then we'll go about our business. We'll also have lots of extra backup. I'm sure some hotels will offer extra tests, some counties may offer extra testing, but that will be the standard. 
there's lots of variables out there in the world. The rates got real high in California and Texas, and it made people worried. The tests were difficult to find. We now have partners in. CVS, they'll put it up on their website now that we have a date. Walgreens, Kaiser, some mail-in companies. You'll be able to go to any CLIA certified lab and get the test. It should not be that difficult. But we're trying to make it the standard so that we're extra safe. If you don't have your test result back yet, let's say it's delayed, you will be in quarantine until you get your test result and then you'll get cleared. Very straightforward, but I'll do several press conferences in the next three weeks to make sure we can constantly reiterate this. So once you get your test results, what do you do with them? Do you submit them to the website for the state or how does that all work? Well, we're going to ask people to carry them with them so that they have that result. There will also be a place on the website to like upload a copy of your of your um, paper, your test, but it's still going to have to be checked because we are going to check that you got that within that 72 hour window before departure, because you can't get the test like three weeks out and have it be worth anything. The reason we have that closed window, that closed window is so that we catch any of those other possible cases that are positives out here. Again, I know some people say it's not perfect. If we had a lot more testing capability, we would test everybody here four days after arrival also. And maybe we'll, over time, when the tests are cheaper and simpler and available, we'll get to that. But for now, this will lower the risk very significantly, and we'll check their temperature, and we'll check their symptoms, and we will observe them. So all those things will keep our rates extremely low. I think it will be less than one out of a thousand people will have asymptomatic COVID and have traveled which is an incredibly low number because we're probably only gonna get eight or so thousand people traveling. Thanks to the LG for being with us today here at H&N. By the way, in case you're wondering, he says he's recovering nicely after being diagnosed with COVID-19 himself. He also says he hasn't had any symptoms for five days. During this latest round of restrictions for Oahu, people have only been allowed to go to the beach and park alone, and retail stores and restaurants have been shuttered. Many local businesses have been forced to close for good. Others are struggling to stay afloat. Highway Inn owner Monica Ryan is calling for these three things. A renewal of the Paycheck Protection Program, relief from banks on their loans, and rent relief from landlords. We have amazing memories with our staff, the community, and our customers. We've seen multiple generations walk through our doors. Um, we have employees that have been with us for 35, 40 years. And these are the things that are being jeopardized. These are the things that are being threatened. Highway Inn for employees, about 120 employees. That's 120 employees lost. If we can't survive this pandemic, and the longer this continues, the worst is yet to come. But we have done everything within our power. We, we went to online platform curbside pickup. We're doing vacuum sealed bags now. We did Ohana meals, right? We're doing the PPE. We're doing the social distancing. We don't allow our staff to eat together in lunchrooms anymore. Right? We are doing everything we possibly can. She helped start a petition calling for action at heartandsoulhawaii.com. The feds released a report about the company that manages the Ukiyo Okutsu State Veterans Home in Hilo. As Jolani Martinez reports, it outlines unsafe practices and recommends changes to protect residents. According to the report, Ukiyo Okutsu Veterans Home, which is operated by Avalon Healthcare, had some COVID-19 preventative measures in place since the start of the pandemic, but not enough. These include staff coming into contact with multiple wings of residents without changing PPE, inconsistent mask wearing by residents outside of their rooms, and a lack of hand sanitizer stations and proper cleaning. One social worker expressed exhaustion, working extended hours and covering other duties due to a shortage of staff. The social worker says the shortage was not only due to staff testing positive, but because of staff quitting. The report states that leadership did not appear to feel a need for more staffing. In response to the assessment and recommendations by the VA, Avalon Healthcare says, quote, in part, the facility had already implemented a large number of the recommendations. For those not already in place, the facility began implementing many of the remaining recommendations prior to the arrival of the Tiger team. Jolani Martinez, Hawaii News Now.
Developing news from Washington, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is setting up a big fight on Capitol Hill. We got Deborah Alfaron with more on this new wrinkle in the presidential election. President Trump says he'll name a Supreme Court replacement for the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg this week. We will have probably services on Thursday or Friday, as I understand it. I think, you know, the respect we should wait till the services are over mm -hmm. for Justice Ginsburg. And uh, so we're looking probably at Friday or maybe Saturday. CBS News has learned two of the top contenders are U.S. Court of Appeals judges Amy Coney Barrett and Barbara Lagoa. Senate Republicans say they will move swiftly to vote on the nominee. The president was elected to do this and the Senate was elected to confirm th th this nomination. But Democrats point to 2016 when Republicans blocked President Obama's Supreme Court nominee Merrick Garland with eight months until the election. They made it very clear that if this happens in an election year, that whoever wins the election should be able to decide who the Supreme Court justice is. The people choose the president, the president chooses the nominee. The fight over Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat on the high court has shaken up the presidential election and energized the base on both sides. <laughs> Fill that seat has become a rallying cry on the right, and the Trump campaign is even selling t-shirts with the slogan. That's what we're going to do. We're going to fill the seat. If I win this election, President Trump's nominee should be withdrawn. As a new president, I should be the one who nominates Justice Ginsburg's successor. Democrats have raised more than $100 million since news of Ginsburg's death broke Friday night. Deborah Alfaron, CBS News, the White House. The man in charge of the rail project is expected to be ousted from his position. Andrew Robbins has been the CEO for three years. On Friday, the rail board chairman sent an email to staff saying a committee will recommend against renewing Robbins' contract. It's set to expire at the end of the year. This comes as the rail authority struggles to find a private partner to help develop the final leg of the project. The full board meets Thursday to vote on whether to renew Robbins' contract. Hawaii may have already lost a thousand businesses amid the pandemic. Howard Dykus has more. No one knows how many for sure, but most businesses are represented on Yelp. And Yelp says from March through July 10, for every thousand listed businesses here, about seven had permanently closed. Only Nevada was worse. Honolulu closures topped seven per thousand, commensurate with San Francisco. This is almost certainly an undercount, though, if only because a lot has happened since July 10. A lot of businesses are walking dead, hoping for that quick rebound that would save them that may or may not come, or the federal rent assistance that so far shows no sign of coming. Collier's Hawaii reports the sale of the Harbor Arms, three stories and 30 rooms near Pearl Ridge. Both seller and buyer are local. The new Otani Kamana Beach has sent its workers layoff notices, but says new management in December might re-employ them. As promised, NCL and Royal Caribbean have sent CDC their formal request to sail again with details on their new COVID procedures. The coronavirus is surging in Europe as many countries are worried about what to do now. Many fear taking a drastic step like another lockdown could only harm their economies. Ian Lee has much more. Europe faces looming lockdowns as coronavirus cases spike. Spain saw more than 500 deaths in the past week while imposing new travel restrictions in the country's capital. France also mandated new rules on wearing masks as cases rise. The continent has recorded 300,000 new COVID patients in the past seven days, a worrying trend, say health experts. We do have a very serious situation unfolding before us. Weekly cases have now exceeded those reported when the pandemic first peaked in Europe in March. Here in the UK, cases are doubling every week. Officials are cracking down on quarantine violators as they say the country has turned a bad corner. In this period of the next six months, I think we have to realise that we have to take this collectively very seriously. And in a twist, Sweden, which refused to lock down and had high infection and death rates, is reporting only 14 patients in intensive care and a single-digit daily death toll since July. But even officials there say it's too soon to know if their strategy is behind their current low numbers. Ian Lee, CBS News, London.
And we're tracking some severe weather here in the H&N Digital Center. Let me pull up a shot I have for us to show. Ashley, what are we seeing there? So this is a live look at Matagorda, Texas, where residents are bracing for destructive flooding and storm surge as Tropical Storm Beta slowly moves towards parts of Texas and Louisiana. The National Hurricane Center says Beta could bring up to 15 inches of rain and five feet of storm surge in some coastal communities. The storm is set to make landfall somewhere along the upper Gulf Coast late today and flash flooding is possible in Arkansas and Mississippi as the system moves further inland and for our podcast listeners what we're looking at is some pretty dreary conditions not i wouldn't call it severe yet some choppy waves coming into shore there and some people still on the beach nothing like it looks like here because mm -hmm. it is gorgeous outside today on this monday yep it's monday billy's in for guy with an update on our weather Aloha, happy Monday. I'm Billy B sitting in for Guy Hockey. We're recording this just after 9 a.m. And uh, let's go ahead and give you a forecast for your Monday. First of all, let's talk about the fact that back in June, did you remember summer solstice was on June 20th? Well, now the Earth is revolving around the sun. Coming up tomorrow, Guy Hockey will be talking about the autumn equinox. That's going to occur at 3.30 in the morning. That's when the sun is over the equator. And there's just as much time in the daytime as there is in the nighttime. Let's go ahead and get you your surf forecast and there's three to five foot surf on the south and north shores. There's a new north shore swell that's approaching coming up on Wednesday, two to four pretty much everywhere else. As far as your temperatures go, daytime highs are going to be near 90 for Maui 89, but those temperatures are going to feel more like 92, 93 degrees. Mostly sunny with a few showers. Northeasterly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. That stretches from Oahu all the way down to Hawaii Island. The only place with a little bit of difference is going to be Kauai. They've got mostly to partly cloudy skies and a 70% chance of rain. Of course, your seven day forecast shows it's pretty much sunshine for most of the week. That's your forecast. You can always get the latest on air, online, on your mobile device and at hawaiinewsnow.com. Sea level rise is threatening to wash away 40% of Hawaii's beaches by the year 2050. Casey Lund is in Waikiki with details on the new study out of the University of Hawaii. This is one of the world's most famous beaches, but even here you can see the effects of shoreline hardening where we've built seawalls and really tried to maintain a lot of the sand here in Waikiki. It's caused big problems. For example, this lifeguard tower used to be on that pedal, but because of shoreline erosion, they did have to move that back. And so much has been learned in that study from UH. We want to talk to Cami Tavares with us, a graduate researcher. Cami, you guys have been at this for a few years. Tell us kind of what you've learned in this new study that was released recently. Yeah, so uh, we've learned that erosion is a really big issue here and that our go-to response is shoreline hardening. And as a result, we've seen a lot of our beaches disappear. And we expect with more sea level rise, that more areas are going to experience erosion issues, want to harden their shoreline, and we could see a lot more beach loss. And when we talk about that, I, I, my mind goes right to the North Shore. And we've covered the problems up there extensively with property owners trying to do their best to maintain what they have. Can you talk to us a little bit about what is wrong with the practices we're currently doing up there um, as people try to maintain their shoreline and, and what we should be doing? Yeah, so what the way that shorelines are hardened today is through the emergency permitting process. And so what happens is we have homes that are experiencing erosion and they are going to harden their shoreline once the erosion hazard becomes dangerously close to their homes. And so we have these homes that are threatened and the only option really right now is to harden them when we have the erosion issues. There really isn't anything in place for us to um, give beachfront landowners other options, perhaps to transition away from the shoreline if their property is doomed to erosion. What can our community, our government leaders uh, do right now to try to take action and reverse some of this? Yeah, so we really need a government program that will facilitate collaboration between our government agencies and communities, not just the beachfront landowners, but those who um, care about those spaces. We really need collaboration to decide the future of those beaches, whether we want to protect them or if we will allow hardening in those areas. And if we do want to protect them, it's important that we um, plan sustainable options for us to transition the entire beach developments away from the shoreline. Cami Tavares, thank you so much for being with us today. There's a lot to get into with that study. Of course, we just talked a little bit about it briefly, but you can find out more 
uh, at a link on hawaiinewsnow.com. Reporting from Waikiki Beach, I'm Casey Lund for This Is Now. All right, if you love all things Baby Yoda and Mandalorian, that's me, <laughs> you're going to love Mondays. That's right, I said you're going to love Mondays. I don't know how true I'm being there. <laughs> um, that's because the show, well, it premieres on a Friday, actually, Mandalorian, October 30th, but starting Monday the 26th, you'll be able to take part in Mando Mondays. What is that, you ask? It's when Disney and Lucasfilm will debut all their new merch, everything from collectibles, clothes, books, comics. The new stru- stuff will drop on those Mando Mondays. Check it out at mandomondays.com every Monday for the next nine weeks. I was at Target this weekend. So much Baby Yoda stuff. Oh, I, I don't even know if we need more. But there's a lot out there. Mando Mondays. All right, bring it on. Remember when you were a kid and you would play outside and you would get, like, grass stains on Mm -hmm. your clothes? Well, Gucci, the luxury brand, is incorporating that look into its new line. So these overalls have been purposely stained with grass, and they're going for $1,400. It's all part of Gucci's grunge-inspired fall-winter 2020 collection. And if overalls aren't your thing, they also have grass-stained jeans. Those are going for $1,200. Hundred dollars. What? I know. See, mom, I told you my grass stains were <laughs> just for style. <laughs> right. And speaking kid. of clothing lines, Walmart is launching a new private label. The no apparel line will be sold for men and women. It's called Free Assembly and will be sold in stores and online. Items are priced from nine to forty-five bucks, and the company is looking to grab some of the market share in apparel since a lot of major clothing realtor, uh, realtors uh, retailers were forced to close. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. As much heartache as the pandemic has, of course, caused, it is also sparking some creativity, especially with photography. We got Nancy Chin with more on that. Ron Haviv has traveled the world as a professional photojournalist for 30 years, raising awareness about human rights abuses. Now he's covering a different kind of suffering. It is a war that we are fighting human beings against this virus um, is something that is larger than anything that I've really documented before. Each picture building a visual record of this historical time. Our responsibility is to make sure that we are observing and documenting the history that's happening before us. So when we look back or when we want to look back in a week, a month, a year, five years, there are things to look back at. And the professionals are getting plenty of help. Our business overall um, really has grown in the significant double digits. Shutterfly President Jim Hilt has seen a surge in photo storage since the pandemic, along with a 50 percent increase in photo gifts as amateur photographers find inspiration in the once in a lifetime scenes. People step back and say, you know what, this is a unique time in my life. And as much as I want to be done with it, um, I'm going to make sure that I look back on it and recognize what was meaningful about it. Google Photos has also seen a jump so big, it decided to stop backing up pictures from messaging apps to save space. What is the power of photography right now? I think photography has this ability to to humanize. For Haviv, the pandemic has cut close to the bone. His father died of the coronavirus in May, a loss he shared with the world through his lens. We can witness that and see the family interaction, and you can say that could be very easily myself and my family. That's where photography really comes in. Creating a document of this time, not just for Americans, but for humanity. Nancy Chen, CBS News, New York. All right, guys, I want to tell you about some breaking news really quickly into our newsroom. Our web team is writing it up right now. There's been a shark bite incident on Maui in the Kalama Beach area. Look for that on our HN digital platforms.